Some nuclear reactions are very well known and have been thoroughly studied. One would therefore expect that we know all there is about such reactions, and that we understand the products created by these reactions. After all, they are routinely used in nuclear power plants and nuclear warhead tests. Let's examine if Sam can provide a different perspective on these. In essence, there are two types of nuclear reactions, fusing and fissioning, which is building and disintegration of elements. Transmutations are a result of these and often result in the emission or absorption in some cases of particles called alpha and beta particles. Beta particle emissions are split into two groups, beta minus and beta plus. The latter may actually show the absorption of a particle rather than the emission, but this is something that we will come back to later. We will start with alpha decay. Here an atom ejects an alpha particle and is converted into a different element. But why is an alpha particle emitted and not a series of protons, neutrons, or a combination of these? In SAM we use the concept of densest packing, which means a combination of protons and proton-electron pairs will attempt to pack themselves into the smallest possible configuration, as this will be the lowest energy configuration. Unstable atoms are therefore in a specific configuration that is not stable. They need to resettle to adhere to the lowest energy state, and maximum binding energy. In the case of alpha emission they achieve this by ejecting a pair of deuterons from either a 4 ending or two 2 endings on nearby branches. This allows the nucleus to resettle into the lower energy state. But what would the preconditions be for alpha decay? With some minor exceptions there would need to be enough structure in the nucleus so that there are these 4 endings or 2 endings or possibly some proton electron pairs on different branches but close together. This would mean that when they are ejected they are close enough to want to combine into the tetrahedron shape. This means that they will only tend to occur with the larger elements as these are where the branches become more developed. Let's examine some examples of alpha particle emission. The first is the well-known example of firing a proton at lithium. This causes lithium to decay into two alpha particles which are emitted at 180 degrees to each other. Let's now examine one with a larger element. Polonium-210 is not a stable isotope and has a half-life of 138 days. It decays to lead-206 the majority of the time by the emission of an alpha particle. As we can see, this has a 4 ending. Two deuterons are ejected from either side, combining into a tetrahedron, which becomes our alpha particle which is emitted. This means the nucleus must resettle and we can see a slight change to the shape going from polonium-210 to lead-206. Let's now examine beta decay. In the language of the standard model, when a neutron in the nucleus is converted into a proton, a high-speed electron is emitted as well as an antineutrino. This is called beta-minus decay. Equally, if a proton is converted into a neutron, then a high-speed positron is emitted as well as a neutrino. Current theory holds that the positron is an electron with a positive charge. This is called beta-plus decay. Let's start by examining beta-minus decay. In SAM there is no fundamental neutron, therefore when a proton-electron pair in the nucleus loses an electron, the proton remains and the electron is ejected from the nucleus. This can occur if two proton-electron pairs combine to create a deuteron. This can also happen when there is no room in the nucleus to hold all the inner electrons, when there is too much negative charge inside the nucleus. As a consequence, one electron is emitted and a deuteron is created. This is a topic that we will cover in more detail in the future. Let's examine an example we are all familiar with from our densest packing video. When we looked at boron-12, we said that it would decay to carbon-12. With boron-12, we can see that there are two additional neutrons and proton-electron pairs. They would prefer to create a deuteron, but as each has its own inner electron, this is not possible. By removing one of these inner electrons from one of these pairs, we are left with a proton-electron pair and a single proton. These will readily join to create the deuteron. This means it has an additional deuteron and therefore is now a different element, in this case carbon. 
But what about the antineutrino then? When we examine the kinetic energy of the emitted electron, it should be a very specific value determined by the change in binding energy and the released energy when the electron detaches from the proton. Yet, it is not. In fact, when we examine the kinetic energy, it seems to produce a continuous energy spectrum. The problem was solved by creating an additional particle, the antineutrino. This particle does not interact with normal matter, has almost no mass, but conveniently fills in the gap for the missing energy. So how would we explain this in SAM? There is no definitive answer at this stage, but in SAM they reject the notion of simply inventing a nearly unmeasurable particle with just the right properties. But it might be useful to ponder on this thought. When the inner electron leaves the nucleus, this is not an instantaneous step. It takes time. In this time, the electron loses its kinetic energy gained from the excess energy of the rearrangement. What is measured in a continuous spectrum are different electrons at various points in time during the ejection process, whose velocity is most likely not linear. The one other reason they require the antineutrino was due to the spin of the particles. In the standard model, the spin calculations of the electron, proton, and neutron do not add up unless an additional particle is created to balance this. And so in this case, the neutron would be converted into a proton and an electron. Problem is, when we look at the spins, they do not add up. So another reason they required the antineutrino was to balance this. And the antineutrino spin, magically, is minus a half, which makes the two sides of the equation now balance. In SAM, the spin is considered an artifact of a different model, which needs to be replaced by a proper understanding of the magnetic moment within the nucleus and the atom. Once again, there should be no reason to invent a new particle to fix a calculation issue. Let's move on to look at beta plus decay. Here, at least for higher energies, an atom emits a positron and a neutrino, causing a proton to be converted into a neutron, and the element to change to the prior element. Let's examine an example. Sodium-22 will decay into neon-22 through beta plus decay. In the mainstream model, a positron is ejected, converting a proton into a neutron. This positron then eventually collides with an electron, annihilates, and produces a gamma ray. So let's consider a different way of looking at this reaction. When we first look at sodium-22, you can see the structure is not balanced. There is a lithium ending on one side and only a 4 ending on the other side. If we now look at neon 22, you will immediately see the structure is balanced and one of the protons has moved from the lithium ending to the other side. And this would have meant that the deuteron on the lithium side would need to be split. This would leave one proton electron pair on this side but would require an additional electron to be pulled in, in order to allow the proton to join on the other side, forming a proton-electron pair. This electron is pulled from the outer shell, but as we now move to neon, we require one less electron in the outer shell anyway. You will also notice that there is a difference in the shape between sodium-22 and neon-22. In neon-22, the carbon nucleate has moved closer to the icosahedron shape and hence will have a lower energy configuration. It is more densely packed. The working hypothesis of the SAM team is that there is no positron ejected. In the mainstream model, the positron is responsible for creating two gamma rays when it annihilates with an electron. In the structured atom model, however, these gamma rays are created when the electron is pulled in and the proton moves to its new location. This means that the structure is moving to a lower energy state, a more densely packed structure and therefore the difference in energy must be released. Whenever protons rearrange themselves into a lower energy structure in the nucleus, this will emit gamma rays. So how would this account for the emission of a positron? The electron path will appear to be the opposite of a positron as the mainstream model sees this process in reverse. This means that its path could make it appear as if it were a positive particle, while in fact it is still a negative one. What is a negative charged particle moving towards a positive charge appears as if it is a positive particle racing away from a positive charge. In some senses, you might describe a positron as an electron moving backwards in time. 
So in the SAM model, the movement and rearrangement of the nucleus releases the same amount of energy and is responsible for the emission of gamma rays. There is therefore no positron that is ejected in the SAM model. The idea of an electron moving into the nucleus is actually something that does exist. At lower energies in the mainstream model, there is a process of electron capture as described here, but it only occurs at lower energy levels. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.